Hi everyone, tonight's video is on plants nutrition. We need to talk about what plants need to survive. Now you might be wondering why are we talking about plant nutrition at all when we've been telling you this whole course that plants are autotrophs, which means they can make their own food. And that's true that they can make their own sugars, but of course they need the substances that they use to build that sugar as a source of nutrition. So if we look at the balanced photosynthesis reaction, six carbon dioxides plus six waters plus the energy and sunlight goes to form glucose plus 6O2. Now, of course, you remember that photosynthesis doesn't actually generate glucose. It generates a molecule called G3P, but G3P is a building block of glucose. So we're gonna go ahead and use that balanced reaction. So the first substance that a plant needs in order to survive, in order to carry out this reaction, is carbon dioxide. And its function is as a carbon source for the Calvin cycle. Carbon dioxide enters the plant via a structure in the leaf called the stomata that you have learned about before. It enters by the process of diffusion. Now these stomata that are pictured here in a leaf in yellow and then in an enlarged form over to the right have the ability to open and close. When the plant is very well hydrated, these guard cells that are pictured in green open up the stomata so that carbon dioxide can enter and oxygen can leave. When the plant is low on water, these guard cells close the stomata so that carbon dioxide can no longer get in, but it does help the plant to maintain water inside the plant because water can also not get outside of the plant. The next part of the photosynthetic reaction that the plant needs is water. Water serves as the electron donor in the light reactions that generate NADPH and ATP, and those are located in the thylakoid membrane in the chloroplast. Water enters the roots via the process of osmosis. So in order for osmosis to occur, the driving force for osmosis is a concentration gradient. So there must be a higher concentration of water in the soil than there is in the root in order for water to enter the root by osmosis. In other words, the soil must be hypotonic to the roots in order for water to get into the plant. Now, plants have a way of maximizing their absorption of water by osmosis by using something called root hairs to increase the membrane surface area. If you look at this picture of a root, you can tell, of course, that this is a dicot because you can see a large taproot in the middle. But coming off the side of this are very small lateral roots and even some tinier roots off the lateral roots, and those are called root hairs. And what this does is it increases the surface area if you go all along outside of all of these little root hairs, and the more surface area you have, the more membrane you have, the more osmosis you can have. So plants make this structural modification so that they can get the maximum amount of osmosis, the maximum amount of water out of the soil. Some plants have an additional way to increase the surface area of the roots, and that is they form a mutualistic relationship with a fungus called mycorrhizae. Pictured here is a green plant root with a large taproot, some lateral roots coming off the side, some root hairs, and then you can see this sort of gray fuzzy bit around the roots. That's actually a fungus that is attached to the root and extending off from it. When the fungus does this, it's actually attaching to the root, as I said, the fungus gets nutrition from the plant because the plant is making sugar. So the fungus gets sugars from the plant by doing this. And what the plant gets from this is an even larger surface area of the root for even more osmosis. If you look at the picture on the right, the little white parts here are the fungus mycorrhizae and the brown part are the root hairs. You can see how much more surface area this plant is getting from being in this relationship with the fungus. This is the first example we're going to talk about of a mutualistic relationship where both parties benefit by being by working together. Now, once the water gets into the root, 
how does it move up to the rest of the plant? Well, water moves through the plant in the structure called the xylem, as we learned in a previous video. So once water enters the root via osmosis, it's going to go up through the xylem until it gets up into the leaves. Let's start down here at the root. In order for water to enter the root, the soil must be hypotonic to the root. We call that root pressure because there's a pressure of water to go in from the concentration of water higher in the soil than it is in the root. We call this a push of water from below. If you look at the top of the plant, water exits the plant by diffusion from the stomata. When the stomata are open, water can evaporate from the plant out of the stomata and leave. This is a pull. So we have a push from the bottom and a pull from the top. But how does the water move up the stem through the stylum here? We can see how it's pushed down here and pulled up here, but it's a little harder to see how it moves up through the middle. We need to talk a little bit about the properties of water that you learned in chemistry. So water sticks to each other because it is a polar and bent molecule. So it forms hydrogen bonds with other high water molecules. Water sticks to water, that's called cohesion. Now, additionally, water also sticks to the walls of the xylem. So if you can think of this as water is evaporating out of the stomata being pulled out and being pushed in by the root pressure of hypotonic soil and osmosis, and then the water sticking to each other, it kind of creeps up until it moves out. So this combination of root pressure, adhesion and cohesion of water, and then evaporation via the stomata is enough for water to move from the root all the way up the plant and out of the stomata. My visual when I'm thinking about this is, did you ever have the game Barrel of Monkeys when you were a kid? And if you pull on this monkey, all of the monkeys will move because they're all attached to each other. So I think of it as a barrel of monkeys being pulled up the xylem. Now, do plants need oxygen? Well, yes, they do. Plants have to perform aerobic respiration to make ATP for general cellular reactions like making proteins and making lipids and endocytosis and exocytosis. Photosynthesis only makes enough ATP to run the Calvin cycle. For the plant to do anything else that it needs to do, it has to actually break down a lot of the sugars that it makes in photosynthesis to make some extra ATP. What else do plants need besides sun, water, CO2, and oxygen? Well, that's going to be the subject of the next video, so that's going to be all for tonight.